Welcome to worship here at McFarland. It's so good to connect with you wherever you are, worshiping together, God's people connected by the love of God for each and for all of us. My name is Rockford Johnson. I serve as senior pastor here along with other pastors and great leaders in this church, and we welcome you if you're a guest. If you're just connecting with us for the first time or maybe uh, after a few times, we are so glad that you have found us and we have found you. We hope that you'll communicate with us. Let us know you're worshiping with us today, if you would, on our website on the front page. You can find a way to do that or uh, through Facebook if you're worshiping in that way. Also, send us your prayer requests and concerns. We'd love to celebrate with you and uh, also pray with you about your concerns. And so there's a red button on the front page of McFarlandUMC.org, and you, you can do that. We receive those prayer requests and then pray over them and and through them with you uh, as a staff here at the church. Today we continue our series of sermons and small group study called Together That the World May Know. We're focusing today on the necessity and the power of the shared table. So as we share the table together and come to uh, this time of worship around the Word of God with songs and prayers, let us affirm together that this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And now let's join our hearts together in this great and strong hymn, One Bread, One Body.
would you please join with me now in our call to worship? Though we may be inclined to brag, let us come together with humility. How good a thing it is when all of God's people live together in unity. Though we may be tempted to use harsh words, let us come together with gentleness. How good a thing it is when all of God's people live together in unity. Though we may want everything to happen quickly, let us come together with patience. How good a thing it is when all of God's people live together in unity. Though the world around often encourages hate, let us come together in love. How good a thing it is when all of God's people live together in unity. In humility, gentleness, patience, love, and unity, let us worship the God who has called us together. This week, I shared our beautiful anthem from last week, that song, I Believe, um, sung by our uh, chapel choir. And, and over less than 24 hours, it had over 100 shares. It had almost over 4,000 views. Churches from around the nation were, were messaging me asking, can we use this beautiful piece of worship music? Thank you, McFarland, for the ways in which you make that music and worship possible. Possible not just for our congregation, but possible for the world. It's through your gifts and graces that can support the musical gifts and graces of this church and all the gifts and graces here at McFarland Memorial United Methodist Church. We are invited to continue to support the work of this church. You can do so by going to our website, mcfarlandumc.org slash giving. Uh, you can also give if you have the uh, McFarland app on your phone. It makes giving very easy that way. You're also invited if you prefer to mail or bring in your offering here at the church. Thank you for all that you do to support the life of this church. Would you please pray with me? Saving Christ, you emptied yourself for us, gave of your life for us. This kind of sacrificial love, it's sometimes hard for us to fathom. It's difficult to understand that kind of awesome yet tender love the God of the cosmos could have for each and every one of us. Yet it is in this space of confusion and anxiousness that you meet us, greet us, invite us to share a seat at your table next to you. It's at this table that we share both with you and with those in our church. You share your bread and your body, share your blood and your love. It's here at this table that we find you, and perhaps more importantly, you find us. Discover us again as we recover your shared table of fellowship in our faith and our lives this day and forevermore. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
our scripture passage today, let me just share a little bit of background information uh, with you so that the scripture makes a little more sense. Uh, The ancient city of Antioch in Syria was the third largest city in the Roman Empire when the Apostle Paul was commissioned to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. From the young church there, Paul was launched into his work as a church starter, leader, strategist, and as a practical theologian and teacher for how to be and do church. Antioch became a sort of headquarters for Paul's missionary work. When Paul writes the churches of Galatia to reiterate for them the core truth of the gospel of Jesus, he tells the story of an experience actually a contentious incident between Peter and him in Antioch. It's the story of dueling apostles. Paul tells the story of how he confronted Peter in public with a small corrective speech to make his point that the church's table is a shared table and a sacred table, not to be abandoned even when fear or confusion creates the opportunity. And so now let us hear our scripture today from Galatians 2, verses 11 through 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus, so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this uh, fourth sermon in the series, Together That the World May Know, um, We're doing this uh, series of sermons on shared table, shared humility, shared thinking, etc., not because there is a conflict in this church. We're a very healthy church, whole and effective in so many ways. But we're doing this series because the current context in our culture and world is marked by political conflict, cultural conflict, and struggle in many of our national and global level church denominations. Not least, of course, the United Methodist Church. So we are taking some time to lay out biblical theology and practice of unity as a prevention, you might say. So let us pray. O God of light and love, give us a spirit of wisdom and compassion and insight. Enlighten our eyes and our hearts that we may be able to hear what the Spirit is saying through these meditations, through these thoughts and words. 
as we come around this scripture together. And so we are here in this moment praying for the advance of the mission of Jesus, for the nurture of our lives and our church, and we come listening. Amen. At our house, we have a round oak table with six ornate legs, <clears throat> two sets of three connected by these sturdy and curved oak pieces toward the base. I remember sitting at that table as a young child with my grandpa while grandma was cooking, frying up the catfish that we had caught that day. That's where my grandpa taught me to eat the fried, crispy, salted tails of the catfish. Years later, and after quite a bit of trouble, troubled water under the bridge of their marriage, Grandpa died suddenly of a heart attack while harvesting wheat way up in North Dakota. Well, Grandma almost immediately moved out of that house and moved in with a woman, a friend who was a good friend of hers, so as not to be alone. After some years, and once she had taken all she wanted, the house began to deteriorate. The window next to the table was broken. The house was invaded by vandals. The wind and the rain began to sneak in through the window and do its destructive work on the structure and the finish of that beautiful table. So then Elizabeth and I rescued the table and took it home. I restored the structure. We made it sturdy again and refinished it to be beautiful. And we've used it for decades now as our family table, a place to gather, to eat, to fellowship, to share love and heartache, to play games, do jigsaw puzzles, celebrate holy days. Grandma died with us never really knowing exactly why she walked away and abandoned that table. So now, returning to the story of Paul's letter to the Galatians, where a similar question arises. Peter and Paul are in Antioch together for a period of time. The practice is that the church gathers for a meal, a fellowship like a family, and then ends with the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Both Jewish and Gentile Christians are in the church, and that creates quite a challenging mixture of culture and heritage, etc. All is going well for a while, but then some visitors show up who are disgusted to see Jews eating with Gentiles, especially, it seems, disgusted, perhaps angry, that Peter, the confidant of Jesus, the prominent leader of the Christian mission to the Jewish community, has compromised his loyalty to the authority of the leader in Jerusalem and is found sharing a table with Gentiles. It seems they either threaten Peter or he has his own internal anxiety about sharing the table with Gentiles, or maybe both, because Paul detects fear as the driving factor that causes Peter to abandon the shared table, to just walk away. Paul says Peter drew back and separated himself. He almost paints a picture of a moment in time when those from Jerusalem show up during dinner and catch Peter at the table, and almost a picture of, of him pushing his chair back or, or standing up from reclining at that table as they did in those days and stepping back, putting a real different distance between himself and those who were at the table, between himself and the corrupting Gentile believers. Paul sees the action as a denial of the very truth of the gospel. The verb in the line translated, not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, describes the action of not walking correctly, of walking astray, or walking in the wrong direction. When Peter left the table, he abandoned the truth of the gospel. By his actions, he agreed with those who wanted to restrict the table, separate the sheep from the goats, and shun the Gentiles from the joint fellowship meal, and from the sharing of the Lord's table. 
The picture we get is that Paul, not quite believing what he is seeing, when Peter removes himself from the table, stands up and calls him out in public, reprimands him right there and then. As I said, Paul knows that fear is the culprit, but asks Peter to his face, how can you do this to your friends in Christ? to your family of faith? How could he cave in and deny the true power of God and the gospel to bring those with different experiences together around the shared experience of faith in the faithfulness of God in Christ? Paul indicates that Peter's backpedaling now makes Peter the transgressor, the sinner. Peter's departure from the table amounts to his nullifying the grace or the love of God. Peter is rebuilding a wall that God had torn down. Paul reminds Peter about how each person is put right with God, not by keeping the religious law, but by trusting the faithfulness of Jesus on the cross that that is fully sufficient to, to unite those who are different. And fully sufficient to do that in and by the pure and simple power, this powerful act of God, God's love, made, that, made very clear and very effective in the death of Christ on the cross. Paul ends his stern but loving reprimand of Peter by saying that if simple faith in the crucified Christ is not enough to keep him at the table, then, quote, Christ died for nothing. Wow. Have you ever been at an extended family gathering when two people had a public standoff because one of them offended nearly everyone at the table, this was that. Why? Why was Paul so clear, so strong? Because he loved God in Christ. He loved the body of Christ, the church, with all of his heart and soul and mind and strength. He loved the joy of Christian friendship and fellowship. He loved to watch the holy sorority and fraternity of God's variety of people sharing their stories and songs and experiences at the same table. He loved to see God's new creation in Christ acted out in real people enjoying a meal together and then sharing in the experience of Holy Communion, of remembering the death of Jesus by sharing the bread and the wine in remembrance of Christ. For 53 years since 1968, United Methodists have shared a common table of Holy Communion. Before that, from the Civil War era until 1939, sadly, the church was divided north and south in America by the forces that divided the country. But for almost 100 years, McFarland has been a place where people come to the shared table to celebrate the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and to proclaim the redeeming death of Christ for our lives and the world. From the small beginnings of predecessor churches, we have grown and expanded, welcoming all who would be baptized to share the common table. In fact, to share many lesser, though very significant, tables in and around the church. Think of it. We gather at the Sunday school tables, the men's breakfast table, funeral dinner tables, the tables of wedding receptions, United Methodist Women's Circle tables, we gather as committees and ministry teams around tables, both real and now virtual, to seek the wisdom of the Spirit as we discern direction and ministry and make decisions. We have extended our shared table by adding Finn Hall and beginning the lifeline now called Modern Worship Service to do as Paul teaches, 
to become all things to all people so that we might bring more and more into the fellowship of the faith. The many tables are connected to the one table, the one holy table. My older brother Kim inherited a, or learned a penchant for engineering things from our dad. As an example, for a few, year, a few years ago, when our mother was struggling to get out of her electric recliner, he showed up in the parking lot of the skilled nursing center with wood and electric saw and drill and tools and measuring tape and all those things, and he measured and built for this chair a base with arms that come up alongside the arms of the chair and extend up higher with two sets of pegs so that mom could Re, could pull herself, pull herself up out of the chair and then let herself back down into the chair. And she has used that for several years. People wanted, it, he wanted him to make more of them, etc. But before that happened, we went to his house for Thanksgiving dinner some years ago and walked in to see an extremely long table, dining table, I was amazed that he could even put this table inside his house, at least 20 feet or longer. By that time, of course, three of his sons were married and children were proliferating. He needed more room. They needed more space at the table. Turns out he took two round tables and extended them by putting the drop leaves in them to make them oval, and then he put them together by building another table, a table that was concave on both ends so that it fit neatly between the convex ends of, the, of those two oval tables, and knowing the way my brother builds things, that table is so sturdy and so well connected that you could not move it. They covered it with a long tablecloth that brought it all together and made it ready for extended family dinners, including in-laws and perhaps, on occasion, an outlaw. God has engineered the church to share one holy table. Our scriptures make it clear that not even Peter close confidant of Jesus, leader among the disciples, apostle of the early church, redeemed sinner and faithful leader. Not even Peter dare break the table apart. Any imagined departure from the shared table should give anyone sacred pause and holy second thoughts. Current denominational conflicts along with social, cultural, and political anxiety, frustration, debate, and fear only underscore the necessity of maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, peace that resides in the central affirmation of our faith, Christ crucified and risen. Imagine the pain and the grieving aftermath, if any circumstances were to force separation from what has been a shared table. Imagine genetic families in the same church, parents and children, siblings, etc., cousins, who are persuaded differently on various matters, but who worship together and then at some point feeling forced to choose who would stay and who would go. Imagine long-term friends who share in Sunday school or other ministries being forced to divide and separate. Imagine having shared in the weddings of each other's children, perhaps even one child married to the child of your friend. Imagine having cried together at the funerals of spouses or parents or others and then being told to divide over denominational politics. Imagine having gathered together for years on Christmas Eve, holding candles in the darkness, singing Silent Night, 
or gathering for years for Easter Sunday, hearing the exquisite roar of alleluias and trumpets, and then someone contending that faith and hope cannot hold us together. Imagine having worshipped and given gifts of time and talent and effort and money for years together, or even having come recently and found a wonderful church home of strength and beauty and effectiveness. And then circumstances or agitators create fear, and that fear lead to a decision to get up and walk away from the shared table. Think of the travesty, the sorrow, the hurt. Think of it. Feel its impact, and then pray with me that we all choose always to stay at the same shared table. McFarlane, we are not perfect, but we are a strong and effective church with a great and holy heritage and a bright and good future God has worked in our families and our lives to assemble us together, each of us, into this family of faith. We care deeply for one another. We work effectively with each other. God is adding to our numbers with new baptisms, professions of faith, and new members. We have an open and inviting table. We are companions in the faith. Companion literally meaning sharers of bread, those who are together because of the bread that we share, the bread of life. We are not afraid of the forces of polarization and division. Our confidence is in God and our trust is in the good news of Christ crucified and risen. Our life is knit together by the Spirit of God. And because we are one, we share a common table. And because we worship centered in the shared table of the crucified one, we are held together in fellowship and service. We dare not walk away. As the body of Christ called McFarlane, we have one shared table. Today, of course, it's visually decorated to show that the table extends and grows wider as people come and join us. We share broadly and we welcome many. Of course, we have another table in Finn Hall for our modern worship service, and at times we may set up tables on mission trips or, or during a retreat somewhere. And during this time, of course, there are tables at home while we worship virtually during the pandemic. But the deeper reality, the spiritual reality, is that there is indeed one table, the Lord's table. This McFarland table, this table for Holy Communion that stands in front of this pulpit, was created and built and installed in 1992. Two dear friends collaborated together to accomplish that task, Bob Cornell and Stan Ward. They were in each other's weddings. Bob designed it, and they worked closely together to fund it and have it made and have it installed. It's a material representation of the sacrament of Holy Communion that holds us together. From this table, we are fed and nurtured. By this table, we are brought together and held together. And here's the blessed and happy irony. These two close friends and dear friends who provided this table to the glory of God and in honor and memory of parents. These two friends 
were nearly polar opposites on the secular political spectrum. They were different in conviction, but shared in heart and civil in mind. It was my real privilege to serve Holy Communion from this table at Bob's memorial service. And at that service to hear Stan speak with obvious love and devotion of their friendship for each other and of their different political convictions, but this undying and devoted love. What a testimony to the power of the shared table. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you our thanks and praise that in the death of Jesus, we have found the center of our life together. And we know that the risen Jesus by the Spirit calls us together to be those who share bread and life together. And so we pray that amid the struggle and circumstances of our world, you would help us to learn more and deeper what it means to be together that the world may know. In the name of Jesus, amen. As we come to the table today, we want you to know that all are welcome, for this is not the table of the United Methodist Church, but it is the table of Jesus Christ that connects us all. It is our custom to take up a special offering on Communion Sundays that supports our Thursday Utility Assistance Ministry. You can give online at our website or on our app and designate your gift for utility assistance. And now let us hear Christ's invitation to participate in the Lord's Supper. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we often fail to love you with our whole heart and neglect to love our neighbors, those in need, and even our adversaries, as Jesus has taught us. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so together we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, who by his love and his obedience on the cross has made out of many one, through whom you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in union with Christ's offering for us 
as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us connected here today and on these gifts of bread and wine in this space and in all the spaces you find them as we worship together. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The cup is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The bread is a sharing in the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. This is the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ poured out for you. Thanks be to God. Our thanks, O God, for this holy meal, for this connection we have to the one table and to you. And so, O God, we pray your blessings deep and rich upon us by your grace. In the name and the way of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now, may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that hope may abound in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in God's joy.